Today, discover how the right lubricants can calm your car's squeaks and squeals. We'll also test drive commercial car washes and see which ones are best for your car. And we'll take to the track for one of the country's most exciting vintage car races. Welcome to the Car Care Clinic. Take it away, Lucille. With just a few dollars and an hour's worth of time with your car, you can say thank you to all of those little moving parts in your chassis and extend the life and performance of your car by lubricating parts. We'll start with the basic lubrication of all of the hinges and latches on the car. Now the type of lubrication to use would be white lithium grease or a deep penetrating grease. Now we'll start here with this latch, this hood latch. Get between the latch plate and the latch body. You don't need a whole lot, but you don't need to clean any of it up. Just spray it on and let it go to work. We want to hit this up here and then move on to the hinges. Give the hinges a good spray. And remember, you don't have to clean it up. Let it soak in. And then we're going to move on to the trunk. And we want to get both parts of the trunk latch. Start up here. Give it a good spray. And then go down to the lower part and let's spray it really well. Now, normally, we would be spraying the hinges on this trunk. This happens to be a luxury car where they're totally covered, so I can't get to them, and I'm not going to tear it all apart. Yours may very well be open, and if so, get that spray can up there and cover that hinge really well. Now, the first thing on the door, let's get the hinges. They're easy because you can just spray it right on. We use something a little bit different on the striker on the latch. This is a stainless stick lubricant and there's a reason for using this number one if you brush against it getting in or out it won't stain your clothing and number two it doesn't retain dirt like grease will have uh, anything blows against it you get really dirty grease this will not retain anything I get some of that right up in here and when you're working with the door, the hinges and the striker and everything, don't forget the lock. You know, there's nothing more frustrating than having a sticky door lock. Now here we're not going to use grease, we're going to use a dry graphite, also one that won't contain any dirt or anything. What you need to do first is put the key in enough to open up that little seal and then spray it in. We can wipe this up later. Then spray both sides of the key and put it on in and work it, work it around. Now not only will this keep that lock from being sticky, but if you live in a cold climate, that'll prevent freezing of that lock in the wintertime. A well-looped chassis is essential to a well-maintained car. Perform this service every three to six months. Make it easy by marking it on the calendar and having it done when you have the oil changed. Your car will thank you with a long life and a smooth ride. Discover the best way to wash your car by hand when we return. Have you ever spent half a day on your weekend washing your car only to have it turn out dull and streaky, almost worse than it was when you started? Today we're going to show you the right way to wash your car. The first thing you do is grab your garden hose and start washing off your car. But make sure you do it from the top down. This will take any loose dirt and have it automatically rinsed off all the way to the ground. Now that your car is thoroughly rinsed off, Go ahead and wash it down with a good car wash solution, such as this. You don't want to use a laundry detergent or something like that, as it can really strip the wax that might be on your car off of it. Another real key thing is a lot of people wash cars without soap. This is a huge mistake. The suds that are provided from a car wash soap can really 
add to the lubrication qualities of the car wash and prevent scratching. Also, car wash soaps can add a lot of plating to the car and really enhance the shine of it. It makes a really big difference in just a short time. Once you've gotten that all done, again, take your hose, go ahead and rinse it off. Again, from the top down. Make sure you get all the soap off of the car. And that's it, and you're ready to dry. Obviously, you have to dry your car off. There are a couple of things that you can use that'll really make it a lot easier. Squeegees, real high quality squeegees like this, are great for long, flat surfaces. Another good tool is a high quality chamois. You can either use synthetic or you can use original ones. Get them wet first to soften them up and to get them used to absorbing water. Simply wring it out. And also make sure that you open the chamois up to get as much surface area as possible when drying the car. Drag it across the paint. Maybe wring it out one or two times. There's just one more step in getting the ultimate professional wash job. Take a quick wipe and shine product such as this one, spray it directly on the paint, take a folded up dry terry towel, and wipe it down. It takes about five minutes to do an entire car, and let me tell you, it's well worth the time. Some other useful tips when washing your car, make sure you do the car in the shade, that way the paint won't be too hot, and it'll give you a little bit more time to work with it. Thanks for driving up, and remember, detailing is all about details. Back to you, Lucille. Thanks, Chad. If any of you out there have had problems with your car's air conditioner lately, then you know there's something really strange going on. You can't use Freon, but you need it. Other repairs are very expensive. There's something called retrofit. With us today is Ward Atkinson from the Society of Automotive Engineers. We're going to try to explain some of those ideas away. Welcome, Ward. Thank you for inviting me. Tell us about this Freon thing. Is it actually illegal to use it now? That seems to be the general consensus. No, I'd like to say one thing just for the general knowledge of the public is that the word Freon happens to be a trademark of one of the chemical companies. So R12 or CFC12 is what we've been using in our cars for okay. many, many years. But we all know it as Freon. The general public right. knows it as right. Freon. And CFC12, in the end of 1995, production of new product was, was ceased. CFC12 or refrigerant can continue to be used in your car air conditioning system as long as it's available. So let me make this clear. The CFC12 is not illegal. It's not illegal to use and it can be used as long as supplies are, are existing. The problem is being as the supply of refrigerant diminishes, the cost is going to increase. And right now, we're getting near that point where it's not there anymore? In the uh, summers of, uh, after the first year that refrigerant went out of production, refrigerant supplies began to uh, become shortfall. And consequently, the customer now has to consider if he cannot obtain CFC-12, they then have to consider whether or not they should retrofit their car. And by retrofit, we mean change everything over to use the new refrigerant. There's two types of retrofit. There is what we call in the industry a type one retrofit, which is an extensive retrofit, which may include a compressor or a condenser or something to that degree to return the system to the same level of performance with the new refrigerant as it had produced in the type of cooling as it had with CFC-12. The second retrofit, a type two retrofit, is a retrofit that is basically uh, a retrofit that consists of some fittings and labels, some new lubricant, and the new refrigerant. And the new refrigerant is called? HFC 134A. HFC 134A. Yes. That is available uh, wherever you would, you would need it. Correct. Are there any other materials that can be used instead of the 134? Under the Clean Air Act, the federal government, uh, in a program uh, called SNAP, identified refrigerants that could be used as alternates, both in the commercial industry, such as your home unit, and the mobile industry. And they basically look at the refrigerant to see whether or not it is going to be detrimental to the environment or whether it has a safety concern. The EPA does not test the refrigerant to determine whether or not the system will perform as well or whether the system will have the durability that it would have with the other refrigerants. 
Well, throughout uh, all of our shows, we're trying to make the public be aware that they need to get educated, and that we certainly do on this air conditioning bit. That's sure. Thank sure. you so much for coming in, Ward. Thank you for having me. I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, site of the Vintage Grand Prix, one of the most respected auto shows in the country. This year's Grand Prix marquee is the Jaguar. And what's more fitting than to be here looking at the Jags on today's Car Care Classic? The most observable thing about the Jag, of course, is its beauty. Jaguar has always been famous for its styling, and couple that with the performance and the history of racing victories over the years, you have a very attractive, kind of a romantic image that Jaguar has been uh, associated with ever since this model came out in 1949. One of the high points of the car is the engine. Racing heritage is very, very legendary, and uh, Many drivers in the 50s um, with Jaguar teams such as Sterling Moss and others um, won important races all over Europe with the XK engine. Although this birch gray color is conservative to American eyes, it really was considered attractive in England for the early model run and it was sprayed on the original prototype Job 1 car. Well, the reason uh, it probably is important for all car people who go through this level, this advanced project to mention we, is because something of, on this level is never accomplished by oneself. There's really a whole team of people working on powertrain, bodywork, paintwork, panel fitting, parts acquisition, restoration coordination, um, how the whole thing goes together. But if you can uh, kind of muscle through it, uh, I think you get a, the kind of result that you're, that you're setting out for. Our detailing expert, Chad Heath, has already shown us the best way to hand wash a car. But what if you don't have the time or the driveway? Then most likely you'll turn to the convenience of a car wash. But the quality of the job, the price you pay, and the care of your car will all depend on the type of car wash that you choose. Let's look at a self-service car wash first. In the stall, you have the hands-on feeling of washing your own car, but you have the convenience of using their products and their water. In order to get the best results, follow the instructions located in the stall, tires first, and then do the rest of the car. Start with a good rinse. And don't forget the undercarriage. After the rinse, and before you start washing the car, it's really a good idea to clean that brush. You want to make sure that we don't have any pebbles or anything left in there from the last time that'll scratch the paint or anything. This one seems fine. Wash the car in small segments, rinsing as you go so that you won't leave any smears. And always start at the top and work your way down. And remember to dry your car before you leave. Here's a good tip for you. Bring your own towels that have been pre-soaked in fabric softener. In a pinch, you might use the towels out of the machine here, but be careful, they might scratch. If you're so pressed for time that even a self-serve car wash is too much trouble, then a fully automatic car wash is another possibility. This one is a brushless car wash. Old-style drive throughs that do use brushes have a reputation for being hard on your paint, especially if you have a clear coat finish. So pay attention to the kind of drive through wash you select. Many drive throughs offer a variety of services and a range of prices. I'll take the exterior, the undercarriage and interior. Thank you. Visit the car wash for an informal inspection before you drive your car through. 
First, look at the cleaning cloths. They should have plenty of soap and water, like these here, for lubrication and removal of dirt from the paint. Ideally, your car should get a good lather, rinse, and a second wash. And be sure to ask if the car wash is recycling water. It might seem like a good deed to recycle, but you certainly don't want dirty water splashing over your car. The drive through might have hot air blowers to dry your car, but sometimes employees hand dry the car. Don't overlook the quality of the towels, because wet towels will actually scratch your car. I like the idea here of this service because they have a clothes dryer and they do a laundry load of towels every hour, so the towels are always nice and fresh. And remember, if you don't like the looks of the towels, don't be shy to bring your own. Thank you. Car washes are like any other product or service that you pay for. So be a smart consumer and do your homework first. The most common reason for having to replace disc brake rotors is A, waiting too long to have brake work done, B, corrosion on the rotor surfaces, or C, driving too long at high speeds. We'll have the answer when the Car Care Clinic returns. If you have questions or comments, we'd like to hear from you. Write us at Lucille's Car Care Clinic, care of HGTV, Box 50970, Knoxville, Tennessee, 37950. Be sure to include today's episode number. Welcome back. The answer to our car care quiz is A. Procrastinating on brake service can cause dents not only in your car, but also in your wallet. When it comes to automobiles, this is as close as you can get to traveling through time. We're at the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix, which is the premier vintage and classic car happening in the United States. In a two-day period, nearly 200,000 people visit this event to enjoy the vintage, classic, and international vehicles on display. But the real highlight of this event is the racing. My car is called a Lola. It's a British sports racing car built in about 1959. This particular car has been very successful. It was a uh, national championship car in 1961 here in this country. The car is a 1954 MG T series. This is the F model, TF. I've been to the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix for eight years. Um, and usually I've just been watching people go around and for the last two years I decided to be one of the people that go around. The race course at the Vintage Grand Prix is not designed for the faint of heart. Its precarious curves can wreak havoc on a priceless classic. There is little room for adjustment as the speedsters careen around the course. So why do they do it? These racers go for the thrill on a racetrack that's one of a kind. Oh, holy smokes, it's probably the most difficult vintage race in the country because there's no place to make a mistake. For eight years, I've been in the pits listening to the drivers come back and discuss all aspects of the track, especially the brick walls, <laughs> or the stone walls and the concrete barriers. Um, it's a very difficult track, I believe. Biggest thrill was finishing safely. An event of this size is not possible without the careful coordination of organizers. Amazingly enough, the Vintage Grand Prix is staffed and run entirely by volunteers. My favorite part of the event is, is a twofold deal. One is when the first race car turns its first wheel because it was proved that the Grand Prix through its 1,400 volunteers has done it one more time. And then in November when we present the checks to the charities, that that's the greatest part. The Vintage Grand Prix is really a celebration of the auto and its impact on society. And nothing says it better than this display. It's called 100 Autos for 100 Years. The 1901 Artsberger Steamer is the oldest automobile being featured at the Vintage Grand Prix. Built in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, this steamer is one of three known still to exist today. One of the largest collector car shows in the country, the Grand Prix offers car enthusiasts the chance to take a trip back in time. The immaculate condition of the cars on display serves as a testament to the dedication of the collectors and their restoration of these unique antiques. There is a true love for automobiles among this crowd as they pay tribute to 100 years of American automobile making. 
Well, there was a 58 Ford retractable hardtop that I told her yeah. an anecdote about. <laughs> and the 57 Chevys, those were, uh, when I was in high school in the late 50s and the uh, early 60s, those were the fun cars that we had. Not to be outdone by the Americans, the international displays at the Vintage Grand Prix are also spectacular. This year's featured marquee car of the year is the English sports car legend, the Jaguar. This exhibit features Jags old and new from all over the country. British cars are a traditional display. Approximately 500 of England's finest sports and luxury automobiles can be seen at the Vintage Grand Prix. But the most important element of the event remains, the race. And I just got around them. I finally got to pass somebody. I just got around them and I was determined to stay ahead of them. And I hit the brakes and one wheel locked and the other wheel did not. And so we're back to the races as classic cars and drivers accept the challenge of this torturous track. Pre and post sport classics, Bandini cars, Austin Healy's, and many more race out of the past and into the present at this not to be missed classic car celebration. Thanks for being with us. Join us again next time and remember don't go out on the road without stopping by the Car Care Clinic first. <laughs>